Hello everyone, I'm here to talk to you about uh, cross-compilation with Clang and the LLVM tools. So I'll get a bit of a word of warning to start with. This is kind of, um, it, this isn't a high level talk about what cross-compilation is. It's much more of a, here's what I've learned from bitter experience over trying to get Clang to do various things. So um, there's probably a lot of detail on the slides, not all of it I'm going to talk about. I'll have to skip past a few bits. If you do want anything me to go into any more detail, then please just stop me. Um, I'll try and leave some time for questions at the end. But if I do, I'm going a bit too fast. I apologize um, at that particular point. Okay, so um, I'll just get cracking because there's quite a lot of um, things to go through here. So the first bit, I'm kind of assuming this is Lenaro. You'll be all very familiar about what cross compilation is, and the chances are that you'll be using GCC. So I'm going to go through the refresher very, very quickly. Um, a little bit about what makes up a Clang or LLVM toolchain, because it's very different or slightly different to what you would expect in a GCC toolchain. A little bit more about how you actually use or drive Clang as a cross compiler. Um, my, um, I guess my, my, the, thing, the build system I've used the most for cross compilation, compilation is CMake. I've found using Clang cross compilation there a little bit challenging at times, so I'm just going to give some hints and tips about how I um, got, got, got that to work, um, and some differences between GCC and Clang, that if you are porting some of your code, some of the things to watch out for. Um, and then a final bit of the, sort of just the idea, what would it actually take to make a LLVM toolchain in the same way that we have the, um, the GCC toolchains for ARM at the moment? Okay. So very, very basic definitions. If I ever say the word host, that's the sort of platform that you're compiling on. So something that would typically be an x86 machine, although nowadays with ARM servers, it might even be an AR64 machine, ARM machine these days. Target, that's what you're um, compiling for. So native, it means the host is the same as the target. Cross means that they are different. Okay. Very quickly for the motivation, um, obviously there's performance involved for server, big large servers compiling down to a smaller target like ARM. And on a microcontroller, you can't yet fit a C++, C++ compiler on a BBC micro bit, although I'm sure somebody has tried. Um, okay, so just a very, very quick um, um, slide about some of the challenges you might get when cross-compilation that you might not think about. So when you're cross-compiling for an embedded system, typically you get um, everything compiled statically, so all of your dependencies come with you. If you're cross-compiling for Linux, you have to make sure that if you're compiling against shared objects, you've got to have the sort of um, the same shared objects paths on your um, host side as you have on your cross side, otherwise your, um, when you try and run your application on your target, it won't be able to find your shared libraries. Okay, right. So away from this sort of very quick refresher and onto, um, onto Clang and LLVM. So this is just a sort of little bit about what, what you actually get in a, um, an installation of Clang. Okay, so Clang, in, in, I guess in contrast to GCC, is a native cross-compiler. When you download the installation, you get um, all of the targets there. So you can cross-compile for ARM, you can cross-compile for MIPS, that sort of thing, all with a very quick fl change of flags. Now, that's quite powerful, certainly if you're a compiler developer wanting to see what things do differently on, um, on, um, on uh, different architectures. But it's also quite useful if you're wanting to cross-compile to multiple architectures from the same, same tool chain. Um, so Clang does this by emulating the drivers of the, the sort of compilers it emulates. So as well as being able to emulate the GCC driver, it can also um, emulate the, the um, Windows MSVC compiler if you happen to be using it on that sort of environment. Now, Clang, you can control this all via the target triple. So I'll go into a bit, bit more detail about what the target triple is and how you actually use it. Um, now, I say Clang toolchain, it's any tool chain that you download is incomplete. You need to um, supplement it by either libraries or includes that are in your um, operating system or via another tool chain. Okay. So this is a very, oh, it's been cropped slightly, but um, it, it, it's probably not too important. Um, so this is the sort of the equivalence you would have from a Clang tool chain and a GNU tool chain. So I've put the bits in white where there are pretty much direct equivalents. I put the bits in orange where those tools exist, LLVMAR, LLVM Obstump, but they're generally at the moment, at least at the moment, they're of sort of developer tool status. They're, pro they're sort of aimed mostly at testing LLVM. They're not really aimed at 
friendly user interactions with, uh, with people who aren't developers. But I think that's changing, and hopefully within a, a year or so of work from the community, um, they will be able to remove that orange bit there. And the red bit at the bottom is the C library. At the moment, uh, there are no plans for the Clang tool chain to have a C library. It's pretty much agnostic on there, and you have to fill that out with another bit of the tool chain. Okay. So this is a little bit of detail. I'm not going to go into this particular slide too much. This is if you can refer back to it if you want to. But um, you can select between various bits of these. So when there's um, a GCC equivalent, and say you're compiling on Linux, it'll assume, well, that's already there, so why do I need to use the Clang equivalent? Um, so um, by default, if you're using Clang on a Linux system or something that's been built for that, it will use libgcc and libstud C++ rather than LLVM's libc++. Um, that will obviously change if you're compiling for an Apple platform where those defaults will be reversed. Okay. Right. So now on to actually using Clang as a cross-compiler. So the most important thing that you'll need to work out is the um, target triple. Um, so whenever you see things like um, arm-none-eabi, arm-linux-eabihf, that's all broke down into this particular format here of an arch, sub-arch, vendor, OS environment. Now, not all of these have to be set. They get the values unknown if you leave them out. Um, so, for example, vendor is very often left out if you're compiling for, say, Linux. Um, this is kind of where a lot of proprietary people who've, um, I guess, they've customized Clang will use vendor to then, to, um, will then say, ah, oh, these are my own custom things. Yeah? How do these uh, triples um, relate to the GNU triplets? So the question was, how do these triples relate to the GNU triplets? They're very similar. So um, I guess you would get... I guess you could say this is kind of a, a superset of the triples that you would get on that. Although my understanding from the way the GNU world works is that the triple is much more of a string that um, is sort of baked in when you build the compiler. And um, so, for example, I think some, Linux, some GNU tool chains use EABIHF to mean the hard float versions. Some of them don't use that HF on the end, and you have to use mfloat ABI. Clang pretty much sticks to, well, Clang can't perfectly emulate that distinction. It goes with the EABIHF one at that point. So I think the, the answer is, is they're related, but they're not quite the same. Yes. So one problem that, I've, that I keep facing with the cross-compiling comp the kernel is when the strings don't match, because then Clang does funny things. Yes. So you have to have... The, the triple that you pass to Clang has to really be the one that you have a GNU toolchain for if you want to rely on the GNU toolchain. Yes, definitely. That's, the, that, that's a very good piece of advice. Um, if, you, if you have got a named triple in the thing, use that as much as you can. Um, so the, one of the things that I'm going to go, go in a little bit later is that some of the options. Um, so this target triple, is, it's kind of the way Clang's sort of set up, it's got LLVM at the bottom, and LLVM uses that target triple to do particular code generation, but you don't, LLVM is just an API, you don't interact with it directly, um, whereas Clang is kind of the driver level. So um, things like when you say dash m float ABI equals or dash m arch equals, these get sort of um, consolidated and writ written, merged back into the triple. So the triple LLVM sees may not be the one that you put in at the top with Clang. But yeah, put a good advice is if you've got a GCC with a particular sort of triple, use that same one and then use the clash of the end load. Yeah, if you don't use it, the, uh, you may up, end up with the fallback being the native binaries. So it ends up calling the x86 assembler to compile, the, mm. to, to assemble an, an ARM file because some, uh, some characters in the triple didn't match up with anything that it was looking for. Yeah, it's, uh, the, the dash V option is definitely your friend here because you can actually fork out what it's actually done, not what you wanted it to do <laughs> at that particular point. Right, okay, so an interesting bit from there is the sub arch, where, so it's where you can say, because um, if you say arm dash none or anything arm dash, it'll assume the default for that particular area. So um, if you say arm dash um, Linux dash um, EABI, you'll get arm 7 TDMI as your default CPU, which the chances are you don't want. Um, at that particular point. Okay. So here's just an example of an ARM, uh, the ARM target triple, how you particularly use it. Um, so if you say V7, ARM V7A, then that's going to um, sort of select, be the equivalent of dash 
target equals arm dash with dash m arch equals arm v7a, that type of thing. But the m arch and mcpu will take precedence there. Um, OS, Linux, Android, non. So this is useful in selecting the driver that Clang will use to interpret your command line options. Um, typically for this audience, you'd probably be using Linux, Android, or non. Um, there are other, other ones that exist, things like Fuchsia, BSD, that type of thing. Uh, the environment is interesting. Um, in particular, the difference between GNU ABI and GNU ABI HF. So it, in Clang, um, HF means hard float, so that will sort of set up all the defaults um, for, for that. So that maps quite well to, um, I think, the, um, the way ARM's embed and Linaro's embed, um, Linux distributions of GCC have, have set themselves up. Okay. okay, there's just some examples that have went through there. I won't worry too much about that. Okay, so what does that actually triple do in Clang? Well, one of the first things it does is it's, it, it um, instantiates a toolchain class. And that toolchain class basically governs what includes get set out, what libraries get out. And it's kind of, the toolchain class is kind of, it's a bunch of messy heuristics that Clang uses to try and emulate the driver of whatever it's trying to do. Now, these are hard coded. Um, so there's not an awful lot of customization you can do in certain bits. So generally, if you're using something that's quite common, um, say, for example, a Debian multi-arch sort of layout of a compiler, this works quite well because that's what it's been tested against. But if you've got something that's non-standard or something that you've kind of made up, you generally have to fight it a bit harder to actually get, get the things working. I've also found, I'm telling you this now that there's a toolchain class, is that I found the best way of working out what the compiler's doing is to go look in that toolchain class to try and work out what it's actually done. Um, now, unfortunately, because there's so many different options and this is all in code, the number of possibilities mean this is almost undocumentable. One of my goals when I saw this, I thought, oh, I'll just write down the rules and put them on the slide. And, and I gave up on that idea very quickly. Um, so I'd say that one of the, the best bits of thing, if things go wrong, use the dash V output to dump um, what Clang's doing. If that doesn't work, go look in the toolchain class to work it out. So here's just a sort of an idea of some of the things that Clang will do when it's invoked. You have Clang itself, which is the executable that you run. Um, it will re-invoke itself again as either CC1 for compiling, CC1AS for the integrated assembler, and obviously called the linker. So I've got there on that slide some examples of, of how the options uh, uh, differ between Clang and the driver options. So uh, generally speaking, you don't call those things yourself directly. That's just the compiler's internal language that it's going on there. Um, interestingly, you might be able to see on the um, left side, one with CC1, the target features. Um, so I, when I first saw those features, I thought that was the entire set of features that Clang was communicating. But unfortunately, LLVM can add defaults back in, so it's difficult to know the exact set of what all the target features are in there. This is kind of one of the difficulties that Clang has in that it's all its code generation is done by LLVM um, and Clang itself is built on top of that and it's kind of how the targets are described is kind of shared between the two. Um, it's sort of like Clang needs to know bits about the target, so does LLVM, but you know, LLVM can't go back up to Clang because LLVM can't assume the presence of Clang. So there's some duplication there. Okay. So present this diagram here just to sort of um, show some of the things that you might come across when you're trying to construct a tool chain. So this is kind of how the Clang installation, as you would download it or build and install it, is laid out. So bin obviously contains Clang, all of the sort of um, host tools. And they tend to be native, sorry, they, they are cross compilers by default. You don't only have to worry about that. Um, the include directories, you've got C++, and that will be libc++. That's the um, LLVM um, C++ library. And then you have these clang, clang-c, LLVM, LLVM-c. That's if you're building a tool yourself that's based on um, the LLVM libraries. As a user, just using clang as a compiler, you don't need to worry about those. Uh, those obviously would be host libraries, so you can't use them for cross-compilation. Um, now, the interesting one here, as soon as we get to binaries, we've got lib. And there we've got um, libc++, libc++ plus ABI. I made a mistake, that should be libomp, not libgomp. Um, the libgomp is a GCC equivalent. Now, those are not namespaced for any particular target, so you can only have one, um, I guess, um, 
one host, one type, either x86, ARM, or ART64, um, in terms of the default installation uh, at that particular point. Um, so typically what happens when you're cross-compiling is you tell Clang to go look somewhere else for your cross-compiled um, um, libraries. So in practice, that's not too much of a problem. But if you were thinking, oh, I can build a installation just by copying lots of bits into this directory and work for, say, ARM ART64 at the same time, you prob that's probably not going to work too well. Um, the Clang directory in there is quite useful. That's kind of what, what's called the resource directory. And that's where you have the includes and libraries that are tied to the compiler itself. So that's where things like internal things, where the compiler is sort of, has got a van, well, well, those sort of um, includes and libraries might take advantage of compiler specific things. So you shouldn't expect to be able to compile them with other com another compiler. So those things um, are, are in that, that particular directory. And luckily for things like compiler RT, um, compiler RT is kind of like the libgcc equivalent. That is namespaced per target. So on my installation, I just downloaded an x86. You'll see built-ins dash x8664. Um, and you'll also notice lib Linux. So that's the, um, the sort of directory for the Linux sort of um, driver. So there is a bare metal, if I didn't made a bare metal toolkit, it would look in lib bare metal um, lib clang rt built ins dash arm v6m dot a, that type of thing. OK. Right. OK. So if you're actually going to use one of these um, cross compilation, um, uh, so, well, basically, when I say a clang installation, I mean you go to the website downloads.lrvm.org, whatever. I don't know whether that's the right URL, but you can Google for the right one um, and um, download the toolkit. What do you actually get? What can I use with that? Um, so all host tools are what you need. The libraries probably will be for the host, um, so you've got to be careful with that. Compiler RT will also be for the host. Um, so basically what will ha happen is you'll have to basically point Clang somewhere else to get the libraries and includes that you need. Okay. So. Typically, what we'd be doing here in, in Laris, we'd be using a GCC cross compiler to supply the missing bits of, of the tool chain. And this is where it finds this GCC is governed by two separate options. Um, if you're lucky, you can get away with just sysroot. Um, unfortunately, for the ARM and Linaro um, tools, you need both GCC tool chain and sysroot. So, what Clang does is it looks for a particular directory structure. In from the top of the paths that you give with GCC toolchain or sysroot. Um, I mention that because it's sometimes quite frustrating when you say dash dash GCC toolchain equals this thing. Why is it not finding my includes? Or why is it not finding my libraries? That sort of thing. But it's looking for um, lib GCC, GCC triple, which would normally be arm dash Linux dash EABIHF or whatever the, the GCC was compiled <coughs> for. Um, and then the major minor patch. And it will try and find all of the various GCC installations in, this, in, the, in these various search paths. And it will pick the highest one and assume that that's the one that you wanted it to use. Um, and um, so typically what I find for this one is that if you've, if you've got a Debian multi-arch setup um, with, and you don't give it a sys root, um, things generally just work because it will look in um, the GCC cross, GCC triple, and th that's the way the multi-arch has got it all laid out and it will just work for you. Although there is a bit of a caveat about that later that I'll go on to there. If you're using the ARM and the NARO tool, tool chains, you need to set the GCC tool chain and the sys root. So the, ba the reason you have to do both of them is that when you, use, you go to the sys root, it starts, looking for slash, uh, it starts looking for something relative to the USR directory. And the way the... Um, um, ARM and Linaro um, GCC cross compilers are laid out. They don't have the um, the major minor triple thing in the location that Clang is, Clang is expecting it to be. So you have to say GCC toolchain as well. Okay. So here's an example on multi arch. So this is just on my local machine, just to explain how this thing works and what the dash V option uses. So all of the output there is from the dash V. Um, I've put in red there <coughs> some. A bit of a caveat because because th when you um, it will Clang will always look for some in include directories relative to the sys root. So if your sys root is root, then it will start looking at some directories that might include some host um, header files. So if you've got nothing in in those two red di directory locations, that's probably fine. 
But if you've got some particular library that says, if x86, then do this, um, or if 32 or 64 bit, do this, you can run into some problems that way. Um, and the only way I know to get rid of those is to tell Clang not to include any default um, includes at all. But anyway, that just gives you an idea of where it's found the, um, found the things there. So a slightly more complicated one for going and um, specifying the tool chain itself. Um, I say I won't bother reading out um, all of the things there, but one of the things you'll notice there that I've got no red lines <coughs> there. So it's definitely not picked up any chance of picking up a host and include or library there. Okay. Right. So some of the lo limitations of Clang's driver. So it Clang supports most of the options that you would expect from GCC, but not all of them. For Linux applications, this is typically not a problem. Um, for embedded systems, it can be. Um, so one of the first things is no support for specs files at all. If you give Clang a specs file, it will ignore it. Um, now, Clang has got configuration files that can be used as a kind of replacement for that. I'll go into those a bit later. Now, there's no support for Linux or bare metal multilib at the moment. Um, Android multilib is available, but at the moment there's no ARM multilib um, support. Um, now the heuristics to find a GC installation, as I've just mentioned, are, um, are complicated, um, opaque and incomplete. And whilst they can be improved, I don't think they'll ever be perfect at that particular point. Um, and as I mentioned, multi-arch, it's difficult to, to avoid host pollution. Now, the other thing, the last thing I mentioned, I'm probably going to skip this particular bit because I'm going to assuming it's, um, I, I know that um, time is going to be um, tight here. Um, but if you're doing a GCC toolchain sysroot to point it at a GCC installation, it will naturally pick up lib, lib stood C++, which is the GCC implementation of the C++ header, um, sorry, um, standard library. Um, when you, if you want to use lib C++ itself, it's obviously going to be in a different directory structure relative to the Clang installation, not the GCC one. So you have to specify the includes and libraries directly when you're using C++. Okay. So some additional um, compilation options. So this is some sort of um, extra things that you can do to, sp to make things a bit easier. So first thing, and this is really aimed at people doing embedded systems more than anything else, is the Clang configuration file. So if you think of a configuration file as just a basically a text file with all of, uh, with all of your um, configuration options to find all your headers and libraries. Um, so they're just really con command line options. So there's not anything particularly magic about them, um, but they can include other configuration files. So you can, in theory, build these configuration files up in bits and have them include them and get them sort of a, you know, assembled together out of pieces. Um, now, the other interesting bit is that Clang will look for these in particular directories, and probably not the one that you would expect, which is the directory you're compiling for. Um, so I think the general idea is that somebody who s s provides a tool chain can provide these configuration files alongside Clang for the typical use cases that the people who are going to use those tool chain for, which you can imagine could be quite useful for, say, an embedded tool chain, where you've got various use cases for particular uses of, say, new lib, new lib nano, that, 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 that kind of thing. Um, and um, an interesting bit about how you would specify them is you can say dash dash config config file, but you can also make a symlink to Clang with the prefix um, including the, um, the actual config file name minus the .cfg suffix at the end. And Clang will start, will basically um, automatically look for the armv7l.cfg. So you can kind of avoid users having to do that as long as you name your um, name your clang the right way, that type of thing. Okay. Right. Okay. So it's libc++ compiler RT. So I've been kind of assuming that everyone here has been using libgcc. Um, if you want to use these for ARM, you're going to have to rebuild them for ARM. Um, now, I'm going to skip through the process here because I, 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 my guess is that that's probably not that interesting. And I know the, last, the first time I did this presentation at ARM, I ran out of time. So I'm going to go through this very, very quickly. Um, it's effectively, you have to go through a series of steps, building libunwind, then building libc++ ABI, because that depends on libunwind. libc++ depends on libc++ ABI. Uh, libunwind, so, and then compiler RT depends on that. So as long as you get everything in the right order and give all the right things to CMake, that's kind of how it's, how, how it's done in abstract. In detail, it's quite difficult. I, um, 
there's a lot of sort of fiddly options to get right, but it is possible. Okay, so here's just an example I made to show that you can use libc++ compiler RT for sanitizers. It's in effect the ubisan example that I've just modified to throw and catch an exception just so that I know libunwines worked and um, run that on Quemu. You'll see the amount of options I've had to pass to Clang to actually get the C++ to work um, typically means if you, if you don't particularly care about whether it's libc++ or libstudc++ and you can use libstudc++, my recommendation is just use that. It will be a lot simpler. Um, but yeah, you can see there the bottom line, it's um, where the sanitizers pick, pick that up. That's just an example there. Okay. So what I've been doing so far is really assuming Linux. Um, but uh, in, in many ways, what a lot of people are looking for is not just um, that. They're looking for how could I um, build a tool chain to, say, replace the GCC um, non-EABI um, tool chain. Um, and that's a bit more difficult because there's a lot. There's, with the um, Linux um, tool chains, there's something concrete that um, can be um, or a pretty much almost standard structure of how the um, GCC is laid out and what the libraries are. Whereas for embedded, it's, a, it's basically a whole big mess. You've kind of got, um, um, I guess, two different C libraries and Newlib and Newlib Nano. You've got whether you use um, the um, um, semi-hosting versions or non-semi-hosting versions, um, V6, V7, sorry, V6M, V7M, um, that type of thing. So it all gets very, very complicated very quickly. Um, so th whenever you say dash dash target equals arm non-EABI, you're getting what's called the bare metal driver. And in reality, all that really does is set up the include paths for libc++. So really, you're not doing an awful lot with, it, with that particular one. And you actually have to do a lot of the um, include and library directory paths at the same time. Um, and it will also default to LLD. Um, as the linker, which um, for embedded systems can be a problem, particularly for those with very complicated um, linker scripts. So if you are trying to use um, Clang for embedded systems, I've generally found the best way to do is to use GCC to start with and use its dash V option to find the include and the library paths that it's, that it's found and then use those to, um, for Clang to work out how it would all be picked out. So that, that's kind of the easiest way I found to actually use Clang for compile for embedded systems. Now that obviously is not going to be very friendly for a tool chain. So what I'm going to suggest, and I'll go back to this at the end of the talk, is that um, any particular vendor that tries to um, construct a tool chain for embedded systems, they provide config files um, for the most common cases that can, that can make that work. So um, one of the things that you must do for embedded systems that's going to use compiler RT is you are going to have to cross-compile that because there's no upstream binary that you can download to get V6M, V7M, V8M versions of compiler RT. Now, there is a guide available there, or at least a high-level one that you can go to for, for there. And you need to place those libraries into a, a lib slash bare metal directory for a client to find them. Okay. So moving on to CMake. Uh, uh, for anyone who's had to use it, um, can be quite frustrating at times. Um, so there are, I think AutoConf has similar um, similar options for cross-compiling. Unfortunately, I don't know those off the top of my head, so um, I've not gone into that particular one, one there. So this is sort of hints and tips for people who want to use Clang in a CMake context. So in the first thing that I've found that um, things go wrong is that CMake has a try-compile step, and that try-compile step will um, effectively say, is my compiler sane? So it'll try and compile a C um, program and, or a C++ program if you're using it. And if that fails, you won't get very far with the configuration. Um, so what I've found, if you're compiling for, say, something like V6M, V7M, actually getting the linker to work in that context is quite difficult because you, you have to pass all of the includes and library, libraries um, through. So what I've found the best way to do there is to use C make try compile target equals static library, particularly if you're trying, if for embedded systems, you typically just want to build a library, not a shared object. So it doesn't really matter if your linker doesn't work at that particular point. So you can just then stop at the compile stage and that, that can solve quite, 
uh, it certainly made cross-compiling compiler RT much, much easier at that point. So these various other CMake options um, are a way of passing through things like the sys route and the GCC toolchain directly through to Clang. Um, and you can also set the target that um, CMake will use for its cross-compilation support. Okay. Okay. <coughs> Finally, quite th something that I've had to do quite recently when I was trying to um, use Clang with the Zephyr operating system, um, at that particular point, um, LLD didn't quite work for the linker script, um, so I needed to use um, GCC as the linker driver, um, and um, you ended up having to, because the way CMake works, it will always use the compiler as the linker driver, it won't invoke the linker directly. So um, I ended up changing the CMake um, link executable to GCC. Now, one caveat is when you, you can change the compiler from Clang to GCC, and um, you don't need to worry about how the flags are passed, but if you override the linker, CMake basically says, well, I have no idea how you actually pass the um, objects and the flags to the linker. Um, it's basically assuming you've got a completely custom linker. So basically you need something like what I've got there, which I've pretty much adapted from the default CMake one for GCC for how to pass the libraries and objects through. Okay, okay so on to some of the differences that are found from GCC and Clang. I'm sure the audience who've had probably had a bit, bit more war stories from say the Linux kernel can add plenty of these to this particular bit here. Um, so um, one of the first things you'll find when you're doing any kind of embedded system, ch the chances are that you'll find somebody's written some assembly somewhere. Um, and um, this is where the Clang integrated assembler comes in. So Clang by default builds an assembler um, um, as part of its sort of, um, uh, well, it has the ability to have an integrated assembler. Um, so it doesn't call out to something like GNU AS. Um, the syntax is, pr well, I'd say Clang is probably fussier than, um, than GNU AS in terms of its um, um, support for ARM assembly language. It, it's a bit, you often find it will complain that you've not put a hash in or pound sign in, um, in, in US English for things like some of the LDR um, commands, where strictly speaking, according to the spec, that would be optional. Um, there's other problems with the .w for what, which, which is the wide instruction you would use for thumb too. Sometimes Clang will say, oh, you're not allowed to use it on this instruction when the spec says, yes, you are. Um, so normally these things, you can, you can work around by making making them in a particular syntax that's acceptable to both GNU um, S and Clang. Um, but it still ideally shouldn't happen and that um, Clang should support the full thing. You'll notice that some pseudo instructions are not, ex not um, accepted by Clang. Um, Clang doesn't support alt macro. Now I've not actually run across anything that anyone's actually tried to compile and complained about this. Um, but alt macro is some additional macros um, um, sort of support that's built into GNU AS, but I think that's been used very sparse, uh, sparsely at that particular point. Um, so yeah, so in effect, you'll often find lots of things that are not quite right, and there is an ongoing effort to improve the assembler. One of the things that may never be exactly the same is that um, the LLVM integrated assembler is a single pass, um, so it will go through and it will patch up expressions um, so if, it, if you make an expression, um, Clang doesn't know till very, very late um, in assembly what that will evaluate to. And then it'll then try and backpatch that value. So sometimes you'll find that an assembler needs to make a decision based on what that expression is. And if it has no idea what that expression is going to be because it hasn't got to the label at the end yet, it won't be able to evaluate the expression. Now typically, in terms of what people write in day-to-day -day code, that's generally not a problem, but it's something that you might need to be aware of if you've got very complicated relative expressions referring to labels in the future at that particular point. And you can turn that off and go back to GNU AS if you need to. Okay. So one of the things I noticed while Zephyr that may, uh, looking at Zephyr may, may cause yourself some problems is that Clang will claim to be GCC 4.2.1. Uh, now, um, if, all you, if everything that you need is supported by GCC 4.2.1, that's fine. But if, um, if you've got defines that say, ah, if you're GCC but you need to be level greater than, say, 5, then um, you'll find that that define won't fire for Clang. Now, my understanding the reason for that is, is that um, 
the developers of the plan wanted to be very conservative because they don't support all of what later GCCs support. So they wanted to pick a particularly old version where most, well, almost all of the things were likely to be supported. But basically, it's something to be wary for if you've got a, um, a code base with lots of if GCC greater than version, you may need to go through and use the Clang equivalents to make sure that those things fire, fire for there. So is this likely to is this likely to ever going to change the the number? Like, will it update to four point eight or something? And um, my guess, it may. Do, I think one of the things that was holding it back was Asm Go to support. So it may be that if Asm Go to support gets um, gets far enough along, there'll be another push to do that, or maybe someone will need to push and say, "Hey, can we move this up now? This is gone." But yeah, I think that it, that was one of the major things holding it back. Okay. So some of the things that you may notice whilst using LLD. So by default, if you're using LLD for, say, a Linux application, you really shouldn't see any difference. I'd probably say that the compatibility that LLD has is probably better than Gold does at the moment um, for, for ARM. Um, one of the interesting things is that uh, LLD will default to Z-Z text, and, um, which means that no dynamic relocations are allowed in the text segment. So I only mention that is that some programs do have these, and, um, and GNU L or LD BFD, which is the GNU linker, won't warn about them. So you can sometimes get errors there. Typically, you don't want dynamic relocation in the text section. It's usually a sign that something's wrong in the program. So that's tended not to be a problem um, so far. Now, for embedded systems, one of the big restrictions that LLD has is it's got very limited support for um, O magic and N magic. And what those things do is um, basically turn off paging in the linker. Because obviously in an embedded system, you might not have an MMU. You don't really want things to be four kilobytes aligned all over the place. Um, so LLD does have support for dash capital M, which is OMagic. What that does is it makes the text section writable um, and turns off paging in um, GCC. So all it does in LLD is turned off the, um, turn off the, make the text section writable but it doesn't do anything with the page size. So what I found is that you can simulate that by setting the maximum page size to one um, there. So the program loader um, generation, which is kind of so, but when you write a, a linker script and you have the sections command, the linker has to basically work out where the program segments are. Um, and the algorithm that LLD does has is not exactly the same as the one that um, the GNU linker has. So I typically find if th there are any problems there, you can set that manually yourself with the um, p headers linker script command. Um, and certainly the LLD linker script support is not perfect, as anyone who's tried to use the Linux kernel will, uh, or build the Linux kernel will tell you. And there are various things that, um, thi things that you would think, no one's going to write that until somebody does, unfortunately. Um, so things like, um, Chains of symbol aliases don't always get um, referenced round as the linker makes only a single pass o over these. Um, and there's some syntactic differences um, that will come through. Most of these can be fiddled around, but I think a lot of the problem that comes is that um, people typically don't write a linker script. They write a program that generates a linker script from a bunch of hash defines. Um, and sometimes it's actually quite difficult to... Um, get to the bottom of where all these problems are. Okay, okay. so I'm just going to close up now with some talk about what would it take to make a Clang and LLVM toolchain today. So the first thing, if you want to get, you know, assuming you're a maintainer of a open source project and you want to allow Clang support. So I guess in there's kind of three different scenarios that you might go through to, uh, to make that through. So the first thing is really, it's a documentation approach. It's basically relying on the cross-compilation options of your build system. So chances are you're going to have to um, write down for the user which options they need to do to, in order to feed Clang through into that, uh, particularly if it gets, it gets complicated. Um, an interesting one that you've got to be careful of is programs that build executables that then build more artifacts that are used later in the program. A good example of this is LLVM's table gen. So when you build LLVM, it builds this program called table gen, which is an executable that needs to run on the host that then generates a lot of C code that's used in a later build step. So if you're cross-compiling Clang and turning, turning it to build for ARM, it'll build LLVM table gen for ARM, which if it then tries to run on your x86 hosts, it won't work. 
So you then need, you basically have a separate build option to pass in the location of a host table gen that you can use instead. So if you've got anything like that in your project that's got any sort of intermediate code generator, you then have to be very careful about making sure that that gets compiled for the, for the right host. Um, next approach that things like Android NDK and Google Chrome have done is basically supplied all the tool chains with you, uh, you know, with the project itself. Typically, only very large open source projects can afford um, to, 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 to do that because it effectively means that you've got to have people maintaining that tool chain. Um, and um, again, uh, not many people can afford to um, uh, afford that sort of luxury. But in, in effect, there they've set up the libraries includes for that particular um, tool chain, and it, it, it just um, works automatically out of the box when people compile. And finally, the way to customize Clang is to say, if you've got a completely unique environment, you can basically build your own tool chain class for that. So for example, the Fuchsia operating system does things quite differently to, say, Linux. Um, so they've got their own Fuchsia tool chain class within Clang that sorts all of that out for you. And typically, the more specialized your environment there, the easier it is to write your own tool chain class for that. Okay. So yeah, the last, uh, last slide here is how could we assemble a Clang tool chain today? So there's two cases here. There's a Linux tool chain, which is kind of like equivalent to the um, Linaro ARM-Linux-GNU-ABI-HF. And then there's a bare metal tool chain, which would be the equivalent to ARM-NON-EABI um, there. And so those two things are quite different. So I think the Linux tool chain, we'd be fairly close there. Um, and in many ways, it would just be a matter of copying Clang into, a, you know, into a, the similar directory structure that we have for GCC, probably hard code the sys root um, in the Clang build so that it picks up the GCC um, tool chain's headers for say the C library, that type of thing. We would provide um, the target compiler RT libraries and whatever. So I think that's eminently possible to do. Whether that would be necessary or not, I don't really know. Um, but yes, I think a Linux Clang tool chain would, a cross compiler tool chain would work quite well. The bare metal one is a bit more difficult. Um, it, most likely the, pro the problem here is multi-lib. Um, because you haven't got any multi-lib support or specs files. So in effect, what you would need is a set of configuration files um, that would cover the sort of subset of the um, cases that you think users would want. Um, so the one I've got there, example, ARM v6m, RDI mon, nano, would select the, um, um, the sort of um, semi-hosting new lib nano for Cortex v6m. And that would then pick up all the right libraries and includes for you at that point. And you'd effectively be relying on um, customers to tweak that at that particular point. Um, and you'd probably still stick to GNU bin utils to start with until LLD support for embedded systems can be improved. Um, and in the both cases, if you're supplying any GNU libraries, you probably need to compile them with GCC rather than Clang itself. So again, it's doable, but it would be messy at the moment without um, multi-lib support. Um, in, in Clang. Okay, so I believe that's all I've got for in terms of that. So that's info dump over. <laughs> so um, if anyone wants to talk to me about any of that, um, I can go through some of that in a bit, a bit more slowly um, and, um, and go through any particular scenarios. But if, if anyone's got any questions, um, I'm, I'm happy to, to answer them. Yeah, sure. So does the sys root option for the LLV uh, Clang, is it exactly the same as the sys root option used in the CMake, um, the two chain CMake? It pretty much the same thing. I mean, it, it's, it's effectively saying look for the um, includes and library directions and binary things yeah. relative to that sys root thing. Okay. So yeah, so if you say um, the CMake sys root, it will pass dash dash sys root through to, um, through to Clang. All right, okay. yeah. thank you. So don't feel that you have to ask any questions. I'm I have questions, but I think that take, takes it too far. We have to okay, do that sure. later. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, thank you very much for listening, anyone. Uh, and I say hope you have a good rest of the Connect.